easy way. I said, hello, Prime Minister. You seem worried. What's wrong? She said, I've got problems. And she looked me straight in the face and said, you are my problem. She said, everybody says you're going to take over from me. So I said, and what do you think? She says, you can't. And I said, oh, you think I'm so incompetent? I didn't mean that, Sam. You wouldn't. I want to tell you, I have no intention or even a thought of getting involved in politics or taking over, as long as I command my army without interference. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another intriguing episode on our channel, Curious. 1960s was a time when military dictatorships cast shadow over the post-colonial Asia and Africa. In the midst of elections, some believed India might succumb to the military rule. Yet, that feared eventuality never materialized. The Indian Army's discipline, professionalism and rich traditions, some argue, but the theory falters when you consider the case of Pakistan. While Pakistan shared the same British traditions, its highly professional army eventually intervened to restore order during the time of chaos. So what kept the Indian Army from making a similar move? To unravel this mystery, let's rewind to Pakistan's early days. The military dictatorship in Pakistan has had an interesting prehistory. It begins in undivided India, where the largest single component of the army was drawn from undivided Punjab. Hence, at the time of partition, of all the institutions that Pakistan inherited, the most substantive was its army. Moreover, while in India, the Congress party was highly evolved, durable organization. In Pakistan, the Muslim League was not much more than Jinnah and his private secretary. Hence, there was a dangerous structural imbalance in Pakistan, especially after Jinnah's death in 1948. In the 1950s, riots erupted in Lahore, forcing the civilian authorities to seek the army's intervention. Finally, the army was called out and it swiftly and firmly put down the trouble. The then commanding officer made an unusual request. He asked for another couple of days before withdrawing his troops to the barracks. In those few days, the army proceeded to clean up the city, paint public buildings, repair roads, pull down unauthorized structures and plant trees. Then having performed all these long neglected civic tasks, the army quietly withdrew, leaving Lahore looking as clean and well ordered as an army cantonment. This earned the army a great deal of respect among the public. It had managed to do so for city in few days what the civilian authority had failed to do over the years. Hence, when in 1958 the Governor General of Pakistan responded to a state of political chaos in the country by declaring martial law and calling out the army, there was a section of public that rejoiced at the news. In fact, a saying that went around at the time was, Pakistan mein to ab masha Allah ho gaya, playing on the term martial law and translating roughly as, by the grace of God, things in Pakistan are well now. What followed over the next few years was a period of remarkable na national development in Pakistan under the presidency of General Ayub Khan. Before the military government began to get corrupted by its own power, as always, inevitably happens in such a system. On the other side of the border, the Indian Army shared a similar British inherited tradition with Pakistan, but Nehru took a different path. After independence, Nehru sought to redefine the Army's role, making it subservient to the civil authority. Teen Murthy House, the traditional residence of the Army Chief, was assigned to Prime Minister, symbolizing a shift in power dynamics. Budget cuts and a systematic program to limit the armed forces' influence in the society followed. The appointment of Krishna Menon as a powerful leftist defense minister was a clear attempt to put the military in its place. Despite unintended consequences like the 1962 defeat against China, this approach contributed to making the Indian armed forces coup-proof by the 1970s. Political scientist Stephen Wilkinson in his book Army and the Nation explains the careful measures taken to ensure this coup-proofing. These included diversifying the ethnic composition of the armed forces, establishing robust command and control structures, redefining the order of precedence between civil and military authorities, and more. From controlling promotions to prohibiting public statements by army officers, creating a counterbalancing paramilitary force, and even sending retired chief of staffs as ambassadors, India meticulously implemented measures that would safeguard its democracy. Our top story. It's a sensational claim by senior Congress leader Manish Tiwari. The former information and broadcasting minister has said the controversial news item about the possible military coup in Delhi, published by the Indian Express in 2012, was unfortunate but true. 
the end result of all this is that when in 2012 newspapers breathlessly reported that there has been a coup attempt with the army units being moved towards delhi in the wake of general vk singh affair the people's response was casual shrug dismissing it as a nonsense the coup proofing strategy implemented over the years had proven successful underscoring one of the uncelebrated achievements of nehru era ensuring the durability of indian democracy and with that we conclude this captivating journey into india's history if you have enjoyed this video don't forget to hit the like button share it with your friends and subscribe for more fascinating stories until next time stay informed stay curious thank you